the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus
Praise the Lord, everyone. All right. So we're Pentecostal. So when the preacher says praise the Lord, everyone, that is not a call and response. That is a command to praise the Lord, everyone. So let's try it again. Praise the Lord, everyone. God is too good to be a spectator. I can't spectate when I come to church. I have to participate. I don't want to go to a church where I'm just watching what's going on and I don't get anything from it. If you really want to feel good about what's going on, you have to participate in the game. Yeah, being a spectator is nice, but you really don't get to feel the joy of winning unless you participated in the actual game. God is moving. He is powerful. And he can do anything. We've had a, yeah, I was asked a couple, a month ago or so about preaching and I, something came right to my mind and then it's nice when this happens. The, the sermons I've heard since then have just confirmed that this is the direction God is taking the church. And I'm not trying to, uh, be in competition with what other people say, but I want to give you a different spin and a different thought on something that's been happening. Every service we've been getting, Word from a word from God about what we should be doing next. What we should be doing next. See, we've come from one place and we were trapped there because of circumstances around us. And many people will feel like, well, that's the devil pushing us. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that everything has a season. It was authored by God. Yes, it was frustrating. Yes, it was challenging. Yes, you had to think outside the box on how you were going to connect with God. Yes, it tested you. But it wasn't of the devil. It was God's allowing us to go through a season. In Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 8, 1 through 8, it says, To everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what, what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather them up, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silent, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. I think that pretty much sums up pretty much everything that you can go through in life in just a few short verses. You may be seated. I should have warned you. I tend to be scripture heavy. So if you're waiting for me to go through scriptures, you're going to be standing a long time. God said in Ecclesiastes that he has a season for everything. And I want you to take a second and and focus on verse 2. A time to plant and a time to pluck up which is planted. We have gone through a season where we were trapped in our homes. Where we could only see the congregation half at a time. Maybe you were on the first half of the alphabet. Maybe you were on the second half of the alphabet. And you were wondering, I wonder if they still go to church here. It seemed like Sunday school, what that was hopping, just couldn't get off the ground because they couldn't meet because they didn't want nobody wanted their kids to be in close proximity to other sick kids. The youth fought the good fight, but they, they, they were struggling against people not wanting their teenagers to be around other teenagers because they were afraid they'd get sick. They were feeling like they needed to keep everybody protected. And it was a season in which we had the opportunity to learn a lot about ourselves. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot about myself. I've been in church all my life. And if the doors were open, we were expected to be there. And to not be able to come when you're expected to come, not be able to just show up and, and participate and, and, and feel the joy of the Lord as it goes through the congregation weighs heavy on you. And you become complacent and you become tired and you become, can become weary of doing good works. And it's easy. It's human nature. And I'm not trying to get on anybody because we all faced it from the platform to the ushers. Everybody had to go through the time where they just feel like they they were struggling. They still loved God. They were still committed to God. They still believed in everything they do, but they weren't as excited as they used to be. They weren't as zealful as they used to be. And we were in a season of growth. 
Not numerically, because every time you hear growth, you think of numerical numbers. That's not the only growth the Bible talks about. In fact, that is a very small portion of the growth that the Bible talks about. If you want to know how big the growth process is in the Bible, if you go from the book of Acts to the book of Revelations, everything in between is about growing after you get saved. The entire New Testament from Acts to Revelation is about growing as a saint once you get the salvation process started. That's how important it is. And so we had a time of growing. How do you grow? You get the struggle. You have to push against things. You have to, you have to work at it, right? You want to get muscular? You got to work out. You want to flex your spiritual muscle? You got to go press against something. And now we are coming out of that season. And what's next? In Exodus 23 and 10 through 11, it says, And six years thou shalt sow the land, and shalt gather the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat. And what they leave the beast of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard. The God of, that wrote this book, the God that authored this book, had his process in which he wanted his farmers to go through that shows you how in-depth the Old Testament is. is he, he, he got down to their everyday lives, their farming habits, how, what they should eat, what they shouldn't eat. When I read the Old Testament as somebody that's in the medical field, I look at all the laws. I'm like, well, that makes so much sense. You know, you're not supposed to touch. You're considered unclean three days after you touch a dead body. For those medical people, what's the incubation period for a virus and a bacteria? Three days. So it makes sense. That if that person had something, you touch their body, you should stay away from everybody else for three days. See if you get sick. Makes sense, right? Well, here in the Bible, God is talking about what the farmers should do. They should sow their field for six years and then they should let it rest. Why? Because taking and growing fruit takes the nutrients out of the field and they need a chance to rest. We are no different. You have been in church for any amount of time. You, you, you get this new program and you push and you push and you push and you push. And then you start seeing people fall away. Why? Because they're, they're, they're fatiguing. They, they can't keep up with the program anymore and they need a chance to rest. And it sounds discouraging. Like, oh, I, I, we could have kept going, but the Bible says you need a chance to rest. There are many people in here who feel frustrated right now. You don't know why. You're like, well, I'm out. I'm in church. I'm, I'm moving. I'm, I'm amongst people again. Why do I feel frustrated? And you're looking around. You're trying to find out why something inside of you is just not right. Why something inside of you is struggling. And you're looking for things around you. Is work causing me problems? Is Am I not happy with my neighborhood? Is, am, I, am I frustrated with the people around me? And stop. We have to stop looking on the outside for what ultimately is a spiritual condition. Stop using your logic to try to figure out why you're unsettled in your spirit. Why you feel like, uh, I'm just not happy with what's going on around me. I don't feel like, I feel like I could be doing more. I feel like, I like, I feel like other people in the church could be doing more. I feel like we could be doing more in the community. You're feeling this restlessness in your spirit and you're looking around and you're looking for people to blame and it's not a blame game. It's about what's going on inside of you. God is pulling at your heart. He's like, the season is over where I'm just letting you grow. And when I'm season is over where I'm letting you rest. The season is over where I'm letting you bask in what you have accomplished all these years. And it's time for you to start getting a little more motivated. It's time for you to start getting ready to plant. It's time for you to get ready to sow. Who here knows the difference between outreach and witness? My, 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 my theological people here. Anybody know the difference? I, don't know, I won't put you on the spot. If this was actually a Wednesday night, I probably would. But since we're on a Sunday night, I have to be good. An outreach is a cognitive effort to go and help someone. That is an outreach. You ain't got gas money? I got gas money? I give it to you. That's an outreach, right? One time event. I did something nice for you. I reached out, showed the love of God in an event that I did one time. You could have community outreach where we go and knock doors. Thank God we don't do that very often anymore. <laughs> I've done it. You go and knock doors. It's an outreach event. You know, you need to do those things. And God blesses you. But honestly, the return on that effort is very small. You get blessed, they get blessed, and it moves on. But a witness 
is a representation of what God is. It is how you live. It is how you go through your community. It is how you behave. It is the words you choose to use. You can act all spiritual and quote scripture, but if you're cussing up like a sailor, nobody thinks you're genuine. Right? If you can dress with a suit and tie and tell everybody how great service was on Sunday, but if you're talking about people behind their back, nobody thinks you're genuine. Right? I know this is a spiritual aspect, but you got to have practical as well. You have to witness. You have to be a witness. You have to live your life in a way. Paul speaks in the New Testament. He says, I pray without ceasing. Now, when I was, I may have told you this. When I was young, that sounded impressive. Like, man, that's a spiritual dude right there. He never stopped praying. <laughs> I was like three or five, I was like five or six. And I thought that the Sunday school teacher was telling me this. And I'm thinking, this is awesome. I, I, I'll never get there. As I got a little older, I started to understand when he said pray without ceasing, that means everything he does is with the thought of prayer. The very leaving of his house is worshiping God. The very conversation he has at work. Paul's a tent maker. He's so intense talking to people across, so intense on the other side. And he's worshiping God by witnessing. He is showing them the God's love, even as he did his work. That's prayer without ceasing. You smash your hand with the fang- your finger with a hammer. Pray without ceasing. <laughs> uh, my, growing up, our, our assistant pastor was blind, and he, he helped build the church. He did it tactile. So you can imagine, he hit his thumb several times with a hammer because that was the only way he knew where he was going to put the nail. <laughs> and one guy, one of the saints came, and he watched him all day. Didn't help him. He wanted to see what would happen when the preacher hit his finger. People are watching you. If you profess to go to this church, people are watching you. If you profess to have the Holy Ghost, people are watching you. They want to see you trip up. They want to see you make a mistake because it justifies the way they live. It's a shame the way that is. You can't live scared and not talk to people, but you have to be cognizant of this. I cannot allow pollution of this environment to come into my mind. I can't read things that are going to give me words I shouldn't say. I can't listen to music that is going to have me uttering things that are not godly. I have to be very particular about what I allow into me because that's what's going to come out when I'm not expecting it. I had a lady I worked with and I would joke with her. She knew I was a preacher and her and another person would tease each other and she, she'd go, he's stealing my Holy Ghost. I said, baby, he can't steal your Holy Ghost. You can only give it away. Ain't nobody can steal your Holy Ghost. You can only give it away. And we would have that conversation every night. We would tease each other. But it's the truth. Nobody can steal your witness. You can only give it away. You can only rob them of your witness. In this season of change, you should start to feel a little excitement. You say, why? I just feel frustrated. No, this, you're looking at it the wrong way. See, if the disciples hadn't had a night where they didn't catch any fish, they wouldn't have a morning where they had a great multitude of fish. If Moses never had to run from Egypt, he never would have found God and been able to lead the people out. If Abraham hadn't been chased from this country to that country, he never would have gone to the place where God promised his children and his grandchildren would inhabit. Every season that we transition has the opportunity to be something we have never seen before. God said, greater things than these will you do. We need to come from this time of transition expecting greater things than this church has ever seen. Greater blessings greater growth, greater witness, greater miracles. See, we as Christians like to put this, our God in a box. God doesn't like to be put in a box. That's why he's got an order of things. You need to stop being frustrated about what's going on around you and start figuring out why God's making you be a little frustrated and say, okay, God, what do you need me to do? Obviously, it's time for me to move forward. Obviously, it's time for me to stop being the person I am right now and start going and doing something new, something more exciting, something more. I uh, had an opportunity in my last church to bring in a new program, and the program was about 
growing. And if y'all get to know me, you'll know I'm fairly blunt. And I looked at all the saints. I said, you've been doing this job for 20 years. If you ain't careful and don't start growing, I'll find somebody that can do it better. They did not like me for some reason. (laughs) But I explained to them, God's promises don't wait for you to be ready. He gives you a season to get it right. And then when you don't move forward, he finds someone else. I, you'll see me where when I work the altar, I, I don't go running up to the first person I see. I, I linger. Why? Because I want to make sure that I'm in God's will. But I have, when I was younger, I would linger too long. And God finally said, well, I'm done waiting on you. He go find somebody else. The problem was, is I may have had an experience in my life that would have touched them in a special way. But because I hesitated and they were getting ready to leave, God had another preacher go do it. It's the same thing in church. You've been doing something. You have something in your heart. You have something that you're doing. And God is asking you to press forward, to do more, to grow. And you're like, well, I just don't like what's going on. I don't like this. I don't like that. It's not about what you like. It's about what God needs. You want to be frustrated? Be middle management. Got the pastor pushing here and the Sunday school and everybody else pushing here. And you want to see frustrated, Right? And it's the same in work. Anybody that does middle management at work, you got the executives here and you got your customers here and you're sitting there trying to work it out. That's frustrating. And through all of that, I have never seen God not increase. You say, well, I stumbled along. I, I wasn't real good at my job. There's no way that through my skill set that the church would grow. And it grew anyway. Why? Because I was willing to do the job. I can't spell to save my life. But I'm sending emails out. I'm sending memos out. I'm doing all kinds of things. People are sending back to me telling me where I made mistakes. Church still grew. I'm not a very forward and outgoing person most of the time. I have a real hard time walking up to a stranger and starting a conversation. I become the outreach pastor. Figure that one out. (laughs) And despite all my problems and all my flaws, the church grew. Because it didn't have anything to do with me. I was willing And God kind of likes it when you aren't really good at what you do because it shows that he did it, not you. I mean, look at his disciples. Fishermen, a tax collector that nobody liked. I mean, there, there was no theologians. There was no college students. There was no professors. There were no rabbis. He brought a bunch of guys that literally cussed like sailors and he taught them how to spread his word and the church grew don't sell the god within you short because you are projecting his abilities with your limitations matthew 9 36 through 38 but when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd then saith unto his disciples Thy harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore to the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into the harvest. Now, having been an outreach coordinator, I have been amazed. We would go door knocking and put forth an effort. We put out a thousand flyers, little cards that we would hand out. We would give them all out and over a weekend and we would think, man, we're going to see this great return. And then when we get people to come, to, people would come to church and find out they had nothing to do with the flyers that we had. They were driving by and saw the sign. Somebody's grandmother invited them over. It had nothing to do with what we did, but yet people came. And so we have this association that our efforts should show instant results. No, no. We sow the seed so that someone else can reap the harvest. And the harvest that we reaped was sown by someone else. All right. That's how God works. Because if I sow the seed and reap the harvest, look what I did. Look, look what we did. We really did something. This program that we just invented is going to take the nation by storm. No. God's like, no, you're going to plant the seed in this lady's life right here. When she moves to Michigan, she's going to run across a co-worker that's going to tell her about Jesus, and she's going to be saved. As no, you may never know how you touch that woman's life, but it doesn't matter. Because it ain't about how I get feel good about myself or doing something. It's about how God can reach a life. At one of the churches I was at, we were behind a community, down a dirt road. You couldn't even see the church from the dirt road. All you saw was a little piece of the the roof. And one service during pre-service prayer, a guy just shows up, walks in, 
Starts praying. The pastor goes and talks to him. He receives the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. We hadn't even started service yet. What did we do? We didn't do nothing because, I mean, most people didn't even know the church was there because it was so far back. We had one little sign out on the highway. He saw the sign and he came in. God pricked his heart. He looked in the right direction. God brought him in. And something that had never happened in that church before happened that day. People had come off the highway and they, the, the bishop would be on the roof, hanging tile, uh, hanging shingles on the roof. And he would come down and baptize somebody in his work clothes because they just felt like they needed to be baptized. That's what God can do. So when we go out and we be a witness, now there's outreach stuff that goes on in this church all the time, but I'm talking about being a witness today. We live a life that is above not above the world, but above where the lowest denominator can be, right? We don't measure ourselves by the person across the street from us that is worldly. We measure ourselves by God's example. See, if I, if I set the, if I set the, the bar here, I only, have to li- I only have to live right above it. But when the bar is up here, I'm constantly striving to reach it. I only have to be better than the world. If that's why I'm better than the world, I'm better than that guy down the street. Then I am not achieving what God has for me. When I say I'm striving to be like him and I can't make it, I haven't made it yet, but I keep trying. And maybe when, when the Lord comes and I get a new body and I'm up in heaven, I'll be more like him than I'll ever be. But until then, I'm going to keep striving to get to be like Jesus. We have to have a personal commitment to live. A godly life. It's hard, guys. It's hard. You'll be at work and somebody will ask you to do something small and you'll feel this little quake in your spirit. Like, I, that's, that doesn't, that's just, that's not honest. And you're like, oh, it's, it's no big deal. It's, you know, they just want you to go grab a box of this and throw it in somebody's car. No, they didn't pay for it. It's not honest. And then here you are with something so small. And so, because everybody does it. Everybody does it. It's not a big deal. The, the boss even knows everybody does it. It's fine. The moment you do it, though, well, he ain't any better than us. You got to be careful. We have a command by God to go out in the world and preach the gospel. This is Mark sixteen fifteen through 16. I'm, and he said unto them, go ye all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I think Austin talked about last night. Preach doesn't necessarily mean from the pulpit. Preach is to edify God. So I'm going to put on my acting skills here for a second. And we're going to do a couple scenarios about how to witness. All right. Last time I did this, I had a bunch of youth do it and it was great, but I didn't have time that, that for that. So y'all going to be stuck with me. So, all right, I'm a witness to you. You ready? So we're friends. We work, we work together. We're acquaintances. We, we know each other. And, you know, I'm going to tell you all about the boss now. He's not a very good boss. He's a terrible boss. Right? He cannot match his shoes with his belt. This is not what I think our image of this company should be. Terrible. And don't even get me started on his kids. Bad kids. Bad kids. Hey, would you like to go to church? What, would you want to go to church with somebody like that? No, what, what do you say about me when I'm not around? That's what you're thinking, right? Or do you talk about me when I'm not around? How about those of you, that, those of us that go up and we, we see somebody that's on the street and we're like, sweetheart, those, those, you, 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 you can't go to church in those pants. You can't go to sh- church with those shoes. You can't go to church with that hair. You can't go to church with that hat. You can't go. That, that's terrible. That's not what God wants. That's not, that's not how you should act. That's not how you should behave. That's not how you should do. That's not where you should go. And what happens? Oh, you want to come to church? No, you just made me feel like a small, insignificant human being. You made me feel terrible about myself. Then you're trying to invite me to church. You know people like that? If it's your spouse, don't look at them, okay? Please. <laughs> how about the, the Christian that's... I'm going to be talking about church and I'm going to be like, well... Church was good. It, it, the preachers, he said all kinds of nice things and 
and and we got out at a good hour. He wasn't real long winded, and oh, brother Ben was was really good on the piano, and the choir sang a song, and as my kids say, the robes were on, so we had church. <laughs> With that amount of enthusiasm, do you really believe anything I just said? The words were right. The words were right. But the attitude was wrong. How about, how about the Christian that, okay, I want you to come to church, but I, I want to just apologize because, you know, uh, uh, they, we pray real loud and I, I'm so sorry if you're offended and, and, uh, 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 you know, somebody might have running. Don't worry. Uh, I, I, I'm really sorry if that happens. Uh, maybe you should come on Wednesday night. Um, does that sound like somebody you know? Do you want to go to that church when you're already sorry for everything that this person is going to see? How about getting in a big theological discussion? I won't do this one because I got in trouble last time I did this one. You're going to go argue with this person for an hour about why they are wrong and you are right. You are going to bring scriptures and verses and you're going to, and you're going to, you're going to spend this hour long. Do you think after an hour of arguing with somebody that they are any different mindset than when you started? Are you going to be able to get them to come to church? This one reminds me of a story I heard once. There was this big theologian up and he was a, uh, I'm sorry, he was a, uh, uh, he didn't believe in God and he, he, he gave this huge dissertation to this little community about why God wasn't real. And this old gentleman stood up, this old pastor stood up and he started asking the guy questions. And while he was asking questions, he was eating an apple. And what he was doing was he was just reiterating all the points that this, this, this professor had said and throughout the whole thing he was eating the apple and you could tell the professor was getting mad this was so disrespectful this was supposed to be a educational seminar and this guy is eating an apple and at the end he drops the apple in the bag and he says i just have one question was that apple sweet or sour and of course the professor's like well how should i know i've never eaten your apple he goes well then don't tell me about my god if you've never experienced him <laughs> it's that simple you don't have to argue with people You know, there is nothing more energetic than a 10, 11, or 12-year-old girl who's telling you about that, ser- that camp service they just had and how everything was great, and they are excited. They're bouncing off the walls, and, they're tell- and they have just this positive attitude, and on and on it goes. And at the end, you're like, I want, I want to be part of that. I want my kids to be excited about something. And you'll have this opportunity where you'll have this big service and you're, and you're excited and you go tell everybody about it and you're, you're telling your friends and your family and you're telling the people at work and you're telling strangers on the street about how God moved last night and people were healed. And you walk away feeling good about witnessing to somebody and you forgot one important thing. You forgot to tell them where you went to church. How often have you had an opportunity and you've had a meaningful conversation with somebody and you connected with them and you missed that opportunity to invite them to church? Something in you just didn't have the confidence. I was newlywed and I'm in a part store and I, like I said, I don't talk to strangers. And me and this guy were sitting in this really long line and we had this long conversation. I think I was wearing a Kansas City Chiefs hat or something. And he was talking about football and it got on church things and we did all this. And I got my part for the auto parts store and I left. And as I'm walking out, I realized... I didn't invite him to church. He was really interested in what was going on. He got really interested in what church had to offer. And I was so wrapped up in my fixing this car and getting this part that I never had the mindset to witness effectively. I spent, oh, months writing a Bible study for new converts for a church once. And I I mean, the pastor had given me all these notes and he said, organize it into a class. So that's what I did. And through the whole thing, I'm, I'm, he, I got all of his notes and I'm, I'm breaking it down so a teacher can break it down to the class and have, you know, literature and stuff. And at the end, I realized something that was pretty profound for me because I'm not very bright. All that thing that taught them how to witness, how to, how to do things, how to grow as a Christian, how to do all the things, boil down to something very simple. If you can communicate to someone why you come to this church, why you love Jesus, 
why you chose to be baptized in Jesus' name, why you chose to ask forgiveness, why you chose to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That means more to them than knowing a hundred scriptures in a book. It doesn't matter if you cannot memorize one scripture in this book, but if you can communicate to somebody why you love Jesus, you can get them to church. It's not about the technique. It's not about having some special magical touch that you just happen to have or some some special ingredient that you can just get somebody to church. Just share your love of God with them. That's it. That's witnessing. That's the simple. That's witnessing. It's why I love Jesus. That's why I have people at my work who know I'm a preacher. And they will ask me some of the most unusual questions. And I'm very careful how I answer because one wrong word will make them not want to come to church. But I am encouraged that they feel safe enough to come and ask. If I was no different than them, they wouldn't know to ask. They wouldn't even bother to ask because they'd be like, well, he's just like me. He can't possibly know the answer if I don't know the answer. I must be doing something different because they feel comfortable enough to come and ask me about something going on with their kids, something going on with their marriage, something going on. I'm not their preacher. I'm not, I'm not there to pull them into office and have a, a counseling session with them. I'm sitting at the nurse's station and they're asking me this question with everybody around. So nurses have no shame. You'll have to understand. No shame. And I'm flattered that they would come and ask me these questions. It's an opportunity. It seems so small. It doesn't seem like, you know, you, 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 when you envision witnessing to somebody how it's this profound moment in your life where you, you just walked in and everything just fell into place and you just grabbed them by their arm and y'all just walked to church and came in. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen where, where you have this moment. I mean, it may, I've never had it and I'm 42 years old, but a lot of small things add up. A lot of living life the way you're supposed to adds up. It takes a lifetime to build a reputation. It only takes a moment to rip it down. It takes a lifetime for people to understand that you are different than they are. But it takes one moment of weakness to rip that away. This next scripture is a little long and then I'll be wrapping up. Acts 8, 9 through 19. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered and behold, the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard of Samaria that received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For it has yet fallen upon none of them, only that they were baptized in the Lord Jesus. 17. They let, and they laid hands, their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, they may receive the Holy Ghost. This scripture always fascinated me. Here is a man who, through whatever means he was able to, was able to bring what these people perceived as miracles. And here he saw people being healed. He saw the, 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 the lame being able to walk, blind eyes open. None of that fascinated him. The thing that fascinated him the most, and the thing that he was willing to pay for, was when someone received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I've seen and heard great things, but nothing fascinates me more. Nothing inspires me more. No, no greater miracle I have ever seen than when a child is in the altar with their head back and their mouth open and they are praying in a language they never learned and they are feeling the love of God. That is a true miracle. That a husband who has been had a wife in a church for years and years and years comes, finally comes, and he commits himself to God and he speaks in a heavenly language and he's baptized in Jesus' name. That's a true miracle. See, if 
you suddenly are able to walk, that's temporary. But if God can save your soul, that is eternal. We get so wrapped up in these miraculous miracles. We miss what truly is miraculous. When we invite somebody, they come to church. They hear the word of God. They feel the spirit of God in this place. And suddenly they realize there is something missing in their life. They've tried to drink it away. They've tried relationships to make this feeling go away. They've tried to steal and lie and cheat to make it go away. And none of it made it go away. But suddenly they are in this place and something is pricking their heart, telling them, hey, this is what you've been looking for. And you watch them come to the front. You watch them lift up their hands. You watch them to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And they mean it from the bottom of their heart. And all of a sudden, God starts to move upon them. It's beautiful to see. The men and women of God are encouraging them. We don't teach them how to speak in tongues. That's not how that works. We encourage them to let God move. And all of a sudden, they start to, to cry out that they love Jesus and that they need Jesus. And all of a sudden, God takes over. And the Holy Ghost moves inside of them. Why? Tongues. Because it is a representation of something going on the inside that we can hear and see on the outside. And they speak in this heavenly language. And it is a sign. You know who's a sign to? It's not a sign to them. It's a sign to us. They could be at home by themselves and speak in tongues. We wouldn't know. But when it happens here, all of a sudden we're like, hey, we need to make sure this person gets a Bible study. We need to make sure this person is connected with somebody. Because getting the Holy Ghost and being baptized in Jesus only starts your race. It doesn't get you to salvation. If all it took was the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, then the Bible would have stopped at the book of Acts. We wouldn't need any of that other stuff afterwards. Because all you had to do was stop there. Because that's where the, the Holy Ghost salvation process was written. But they kept building on that throughout the Gospels and the epistles. And it's, it's not enough just to start the race. You have to finish the race. How do you finish the race? You finish it by living a godly life, a witness-filled life, a life that is set apart from everyone else, a life that can people take note of. It's hard. It's hard. The Bible says, how do we know that we're his disciples, that we have love one for another? You have to love. You can't hate your brother. You can't talk bad about your brother. You can't talk bad about your sister. You can't, you can't be speaking bad about the pastor and the ministry of the church and then expect somebody to come and want to be at your church. You have to have love. Simon the sorcerer didn't care about any of those things that were going on around him about healings. He didn't care about people suddenly getting financial blessings. He didn't care about any of that stuff. He saw something supernatural. He'd been doing sleight of hand for years. He's been a charlatan for years. He knew how to trick people to believe that a miracle was happening. He had he had a friend from another town come in, pretend to be lame, and he could get him to stand up. He had done all kinds of things to make people believe that he was a powerful man. But there was something that cannot be changed. When I reach into someone, reach onto someone and put my hands on them and they start speaking in tongues, because that is a personal experience. That's not something you witnessed. That was something you participated in. Remember, we talked about participation. I can witness somebody get filled with the Holy Ghost and feel good for them, but that doesn't get me saved. I can watch somebody live an overcoming life. That doesn't get me saved. What gets me saved is being in connected with God and being in his will. You know, I'm not saying you can't go to heaven and never witness to anybody. I'm not saying that because I don't judge. I find it hard to believe that you can. Because if you ain't sharing God's love, you're not following his commandment to spread the good news. If you're not sharing God's love, you, you'll, you'll hold that, 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 that precious jewel hidden away and not let anybody see it. And it becomes tarnished and it becomes dull and it becomes, it loses its luster. And all of a sudden, years later, you open up that Holy Ghost within you and it's, it's no longer sparkling like that diamond it used to be. It's dull. It's dusty. It, it no longer has that shine and, and nobody's impressed with it anymore because it's, it's not been used. But if you work with it and you take care of it and you, and you, and you let people know how, how precious this is and how they can get it too, it stays forefront in your mind and you continue to work on it. You continue to develop that relationship. Witnessing. We are in a time of plenty. You may not see it yet. 
You, you may think, I, I don't see it. There are people in my life have not changed. The people, I'm still, I'm still banging my head up against the wall of the same person that I've been trying to get to come to church for years. Sometimes you need to let that person go in God's hands and turn your focus somewhere else. It's hard when it's, it's your baby. It's hard when it's your baby. It's hard when it's your mom. It's hard when you're, it's hard when it's your spouse. It's hard when it's your dad. But sometimes you gotta realize, hey, I planted the seed. Maybe it's not my harvest. Maybe I, I need to start focusing on somebody else. Maybe I can win somebody else's dad to church. Maybe I can win somebody else's child to church. Maybe I can win somebody else's spouse if they can come to church. And while I'm doing God's work, God will take care of my problem. It's hard. It's so hard. You, you pray for your kids and you want them to, to, to come to church and you want them to live an overcoming life and you want them to, 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 to know Jesus in a special way. It's hard to say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm leaving it in your hands. I'll bring them up for their protection, but I'm not going to harass you anymore. I'm going to trust you. Now, sister over there has a baby that's not going to church. I'm going to go start working on her child because I want her child to go to heaven just as much as I want my child to go to heaven. That's what brothers and sisters in Christ do. My piano player, wherever. Are we going to do the Bible, the dedication first? Okay. All right. I'm not going to mess with the music then i'm going to tidy this up and then we'll move the service on i challenge you right now put this in the back of your mind and as the service progresses i challenge you don't limit yourself with last season don't sit there in stagnation and rest don't allow yourself to to live on past glories and, and past circumstances it's time to move forward God has new things for you. He has new miracles, new blessings, new experiences. I don't want to come to church and feel church the same way I always felt it. I want to see something new. I want to see something exciting. I want the glory of God to come down so thick and so strong. I don't want to leave. I want it so sick and so wrong. I have to push through the power of God just to get to the altar. I can feel it on my skin. I can feel it when I breathe. It's so heavy in here that I can barely get to the altar without being saturated in his presence. That's the God we serve. You're like, where, where's the scripture? Old Testament. God came down with the fire and consumed the temple where Moses was. People were scared and they thought Moses and the temple were gone because he was in this pillar of fire. It happens. But we get something better. God has opened up so much for this world to be able to be blessed, to be able to be reached. All we have to do is live that life that God has commanded us. That's it. Invite them to church. If you're living a godly life, you've already witnessed. They know you're different. They know you have joy. They know you're happy. They know you got good kids. They know that your brothers and sisters are good people. They know you don't steal, cheat, lie. And you look at them and say, hey, I grew up in this. You want your kids to be good kids? Bring them to church. God doesn't just deliver people. He sustains them. Why wait till your kids are bad and on drugs and strung out before you get them in church? How about get them in church so they can avoid all that? The same guy that will deliver them is the same guy that will keep them from it. Let's stand to our feet. But the Moran is right. We have moved into a new season. And I do believe that things have changed for our church and the opportunities have increased for us. Case in point, we had a brand new family in our church this morning, strictly as a result of prayers that we prayed about five, six weeks back about, God, if you'll just put them in my path, I'll talk to them. You know, you bump me into them, and I will talk with them about my faith and my relationship with the Lord. And that person did that, and that family was in church this morning. We've seen a multiplicity of this here recently. I think for us... I think we need to pray a prayer here for God to alter our thinking about people who need to be reached and for us to reach into our community and be ready to invite them.
It depends on what you're looking for. And we get in church and stay in church a while and we get this mentality of what we're expecting. And it's kind of like you buy a brand new red Ford Edge. Isn't it interesting that now all of a sudden everything you see riding up and down the road are red Ford Edges? You know, isn't that amazing how that works? The reason is that's what you're looking for. Okay. And so I think we need to have a little mental change here as to what we are looking for. When we go out into our community and out into our neighborhood and out to work, we need to change the way we look at things and we need to be looking for that opportunity. There are people that are hungry, people who have been watching you, people who, are, who know that you are different. And I want us to pray right now for God to use every one of us spirit filled and that God may provide that opportunity and that we will speak up and speak out and let God use us. Will you do that? Let's pray. God, right now in the name of Jesus, here we are tonight. And Lord, we do know that we have moved into a different season. And we know that this is a season for us. We've had a season of personal growth and evaluation and perspective and searching our hearts and Lord we are now moving into a new season of of outward growth and and Lord we know that evangelism and witnessing and testifying and and walking in the truth in front of people Lord is more important today than it's ever been I'm asking right now that you would alter our thinking help us Lord to go out of this building looking for someone to speak to. Help us to go out of this building looking to talk with that special person about our relationship with you. I'm asking God that you would open the door. Help us, Lord, to bump into them unexpectedly. Help us, Lord, to receive that confirmation from the Spirit that you want us to tell them our testimony. God, I pray that you would use us in the weeks and the months to come. We're seeing growth here and we're seeing progress here and we're seeing new faces and we're hearing new reports and we know you have moved us into a new season and I pray God that you would use us and help us Lord to reach into our community and make a difference in Jesus name